Welcome to Cracking the Code. This is Ryan Skinner, and I've got my good friend Chuck Madden here today. Welcome, Chuck. Good morning, my friend. Oh, my God. Today was a hot start. It, was a, it wasn't easy for me to get going today. I'm still not sure I'm going. I was walking around the house at 2.30 pace and figuring out how I was going to pull this off. Yeah, so I, I think, just to give a little backstory, so Chuck and I meet... Um, a number of years ago, Chuck launches an application called TBV on cell phones, and it's a way that, so I know when I was on probation, why don't I speak for myself, we were told to go to three AA meetings a week or three NA meetings a week and get signatures from somebody at the meeting, and it's anonymous, so you would write Bob Z, uh, Mary F, and they're not going to check it because it's anonymous. And what happened was more and more addicts were dying, so the question is, how do you come up with a way to make an addict or an alcoholic accountable to a meeting? Well... I don't know a single addict or alcoholic that isn't addicted to their phone. And I don't know anybody who's not addicted to their phone. And so by putting a phone with something to track where they're at and to give them access to all these meetings and all these online resources, it was awesome what you came up with. And when you came up with that and you were launching it, Vin Pero, who's a good friend of both of us, and that's how we met. Vin's the chief of probation out of the Woman Courthouse in uh, Massachusetts. And Vin put us together and he was trying to you know get people involved and and it just started there. Yeah, that was uh, but maybe five or six years ago. Hey, thanks for having me this morning. Uh, shout out Chief Pirro, right? Yeah. Not for Vin Pirro puts everybody That's together. Good guy. Yeah, so I was, um, you know, I was still working as a sober coach in Sarasota, Florida, and I would go to court with kids. I'm sober a long time. I become the, the go-to recovery guy. And I would go to court with these kids, and I would say to the judge, Your Honor, so-and-so, he attended eight meetings. He did 100 hours of community service, all this stuff. I basically report. And I took a step back and said, there's, there's got to be a better way to do this. And I knew how important and effective, not necessarily the meetings, but the people I met in the meetings. Right, That was the critical component. So I took a step back and said, <clears throat> there's got to be a better way to do this. No intention of starting my own company. Figured I would reach up to Boston find the solution that was already deployed and bring it to Sarasota. Found out nothing was there. So we started down that journey and kind of the rest is history. Did very, very difficult launch. So we create this app, really quick story. We build an app on your phone. We collect all the meeting locations. We use geofencing and biometrics to make sure you're there to hold yourself accountable, to let the probation officer you know you're there. We get ready to launch, what happens? The world shuts down. Oh, cool, we, la we launch. <laughs> this is a funny story. So we're on, it's a Tuesday. I'm with Chief Piero, his assistant chief, and we're in uh, Bilrica House of Correction, going to meet with Peter Katusian, Middlesex County he's Sheriff, a good guy. on a Tuesday. And we walk out of there, and he's psyched, and we're psyched, and everybody's psyched. And on Thursday, the state of Massachusetts was closed. Literally two days. Can you believe now looking back, it did it was such a blip, it felt like, but it, like the amount of mental illness I mean, for drug addicts, alcoholics, losing meetings. I mean, I know for me, it had a profound impact on my life. Um, you don't realize how important meetings are and, and how crucial it is because when you're in the when you're in green, you know, like we are now, my whole life is you know, tied to a if I'm not at a meeting. <clears throat> I'm getting a text from a guy from here. I'm on a phone call from one of you guys. You get so emergent, but it's the, it's the new guy, a gal, who walks out of the detox or who's at their parents' house and just wants to get sober. And it's like, uh, how do you get it? Yeah. Uh, coming into COVID, that, you know, the world changed. Literally, the world changed. And I think you, you said it right, but I think it applies to everything in life. We don't appreciate what we have until we lose it. And all of a sudden, the the opportunity to basically attend any kind of meeting that you want any time of day or night anywhere was taken for granted and for me it was never about the meetings the, in fact I hated the meetings I hated the people I hated the locations <laughs> I, and I hated the overall concept over time I came to realize that I needed the people and the people were in these rooms so our big position is I don't care how you want to get sober or clean. I don't care if you have big issues. I don't care if you're exploring. I don't care what path you want to take. My suggestion is I've never met anybody that can do them by themselves. So these are places where people hang around and we've got all the modalities. Go find some friends. Like go find your tribe. Because it's not to me, a meeting won't keep me sober, but the people in that I've met along the way 
that are now in my phone, that morning text exchange, that keeps me sober. Because <laughs> I realize there's a lot of people worse than me. Yeah. In our own face. In our, <laughs> our own, in our own right. friend group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, oh, yeah wow. and I don't think people realize uh, what a gift that is. So Chuck and I are on a, tri- on a t- group text, and I call it our tribe, where there's about 15 of us or so. Mm-hmm. And every day there's texts about, I don't know, these some of my foolish friends are trying to solve world hunger and uh, politic issues. And, and I really don't care about much. I just think the fact that I ingrained in a group of guys that touch base first thing in the morning all the way through the day, last thing at night. My first text and last text of every day come from that text chain. Yeah. And I don't think, until you just said it there, I don't think I fully appreciate that because I'm on the inside. But yeah. when I first came to the program, like there was no app to tell me where to go. You had a book. And most of us didn't have a book because we weren't trying to get into recovery. I didn't want to get sober. I just didn't want the legal issues. I didn't want to be poor anymore. I didn't want relationship issues. Um, the, getting sober was just the easiest way to get rid of all those things. Yeah. It's, I don't think anybody really walks in for their very first time and says, hey, I'm here. Things are great. Yeah. I just want to check you guys out. <laughs> I, that's not how it works, right? There's, there's, a, there's a coercive element to finding your way into recovery, I've found. And, and it can be your family, it can be your friends, uh, it can be a boss, co-worker, the cops, Chief Pirro, you know, Bobby, yeah. who was on a couple of weeks ago, right? We, we, we know him from all sides, the emergency room, but there's usually an outside influence that initiates that process. And what we tried to do, just evolving over time, is I know in my own experience, I've been coming around the rooms, I've been sober 85% of the last 25 years. Wow, that's it, a it, time. Yeah, 85%, though, right? We laugh about that. But, but the 15% was the pain. I bounced a pain that I can't even explain to you, right? That first 10 years, I would come around, come in and out, in and out. And I don't know why I kept coming back, but I kept coming back. My nickname in Sarasota is 90 Day Chuck. They laugh at me because I could, I would come around for a few months and then I would disappear, but I would come right back in. But I kept coming, and I don't know why. And now today I have these relationships. To your point, I don't have a group of 17 guys that I text with all day long if I haven't been hanging around with these guys for a period of time long before this. So it takes time to build relationships like anything. Yeah, of course. Like just normal business relationships, sober relationships. So you get this group. The magic in that group is this. We do the banter, right? <clears throat> but you'll notice every now and then – Somebody, we have 17. I count them. 17 people? 17. On that? I didn't know. That. I'd probably be more careful what I was saying if I knew that many people were on it. Well, the cops are on it too. The <laughs> FBI right. is on it. Right. <laughs> the magic of that group, and, and maybe you, you'll not pay attention to this, is not so much what's said because the usual banter, I can tell you what people are going to say as you can. But all of a sudden, someone who usually responds won't respond or will not be impacting in the text. And you'll see other people say, all of a sudden, the banter stops. Where's so and so? Yeah. Hey, you will, and that's the magic. That's just that. Hey, hey, we're come back in. Yeah. Everything okay? Because your baseline has changed, right? You usually participate with us. You're not, but you're not saying anything. So we're going to push into you. That's the magic. Yeah. And you have to develop that, and it takes some time. Yeah, it does take time for people to understand who you are. So. I want to look, so a little bit of your backstory. I'm going to tell what I know of it because um, sometimes it, it, it doesn't. It's a little awkward state about yourself. But you had a, a young age, tremendous amount of success financially, and um, and I say financial only because you and I both know success isn't measured by finances now. But I know that. I know that now. When you're in your twenties, <laughs> it's a scoreboard. It's a scorecard. You know who are you? Here's my business card. Mm-hmm. And you know you were in devel- into development. You were a big part of like moving some dirt for the big dig and. And, you know, in your 20s, you're worth a substantial amount of money. You get the house up here, the house in Sarasota, Florida. For those who don't know, that's like the nicest beach in the world. Literally. Literally. It was number one ranked <laughs> reach in the United States beach uh, or number two next to Hawaiian beach every year. And I was a sandwich away from it. Literally, yeah. I, I could hit a sandwich from my backyard onto those white sands. And see, I can't hit a sandwich, period. So that's why you, <laughs> you don't know. live there. <laughs> but that being said, um, you go through some stuff. You, you lose it all. You get divorced. Um, you, you find, you, you realize like you have to lose, you know, I always say you got to fall to gain it all. You lose all that money and, you know, obviously if you could do it again, you'd rather not lose the money, but you gain who you are along the way. And now you're coming back and I got you back on the upswing, but you weren't all the way up in it, but you were a big part of me find, like help get healthy because I remember you looking at me and I was struggling to stay sober and I'm sitting there and, um, I still did some of the outside stuff this time. The first time I got sober, I went to jail. Second time, it was more of an inside job. I just had some struggles with medication. 
Um, and I just didn't know how to, I would try to stop, I'd put it down. And you looked at me, you said, listen, the house, the cars, the watch, the family, it's all going to go. So you either stop now or you'll stop when it's all gone. But you're going to stop or you're going to die. But either way, it's going to go if you don't stop. And right there, it was the most sobering punch in the face I have had in a long time. And I didn't stop right that second, but it, it stuck with me. And that, that, that message resonated with me. You know, talk a little bit about, you know, a little bit about what it was like in your 20s when you were rocking and rolling. And a little bit about like the anarchy, with, like the nonsense we live when you hop on a flight. I mean, I remember I was going to Chicago when I was dating a girl out there to visit and she was an options trader and she was a very serious professional girl. And I'd be on my way out to Chicago, but I'd end up in Wisconsin or LA or, and she'd be like, well, what do you mean? And I'd be like, well, I met this guy at the bar and you know, we were just having a few drinks. And how did you end up in a different state? And, and your, your, your wife was a, a, a flight attendant. So you were doing it, one, you were doing it free and you got kind of VIP treatment, but two, you were doing it in front of all her colleagues, making her look like an ass. I, I yeah well you know I was making myself look like an ass yeah, but, more than, more than anybody. The, but, but the no. pain you know what I mean yeah so yeah there's a lot in that um I'm, I'll start where you started um I saw in you me I saw a 30 year old version of Chuck this guy that was still on the outside if you if I did a survey in downtown Melrose and said 10 people give me a, an opinion of this guy and they don't know you you know, nine out of 10 would say successful, confident, this, that, you know, squared away. And the truth was, you were a shell. I used to describe myself as in Florida, we, I took the kids to MGM Studios all the time. So in MGM Studios, you walk down what looks like Times Square. So from the outside, it looks like Times Square. Oh, okay. But when you peer behind the wall, it's three quarter inch plywood. It's not Times Square. That was me. Yeah. When I had all the stuff in my 20s, I worked for my dad. Um, my, my dad did not grow up selling 90 acres. My dad worked for the MBTA, self-made, went on to run a very big construction company. I was blessed to work there for an owner. Um, got a lot of opportunity, went out on my own, and just got really lucky. Real, like Almost like a professional athlete lucky. Eight figures by 30. I'm having a fundraiser for the governor of Massachusetts in my newly constructed home. A um, couple of convertible, very expensive cars in the driveway and had no appreciation for any of it, number one. My mind, I had made it. Um, I have a wife, beautiful wife, three or four kids at the time, and I was dead. I was just going to ask you, how about that feeling? I don't know if you could relate. I think you can. It's supposed to feel different. So, wow. Yeah, you're, so you're taking me back. This is how I described it to my therapist. This is free, right? I don't have to pay you for this therapy no, session. No, no, I'll give you what I got. <laughs> the, the I got 20 years of therapy in me, so I can <laughs> share some stuff. <laughs> no, but you just, you just brought me back to um, many, many hours in a, in a chair. And the way I described it was my 20s. So I, I, I drank early. You know, 12 years old, I drank a full bottle of uh, Southern Comfort, threw up all over myself, got in the bus, got chased out of the house. Right. And then it just got went downhill from there. But when I came out of college, somehow the alcohol, I was able to kind of moderate that because there's two addictions that took over. And I knew I wanted money and power. And I was able to supplant the alcoholism with these other things. And I went after that and I got it. But in my mind, <clears throat> you know, we grew up kind of blue collar later in life doing better. But I knew what I wanted. I wanted to live on the other side of Melrose. I wanted to belong to the golf club. I wanted a Mercedes. Didn't know what kind. I just knew that a Mercedes was a cool car. Um, and I had these goals. And I am now 30 years old. I have a house in Sarasota, Florida. Million dollar house. Million dollar house in Melrose. Three cars for the two drivers at each location. And I am absolutely dead. And I would describe it to the therapist like this. Imagine staring your whole life at the moon, having a goal to reach the moon and getting there. And you step out of the spaceship and it, it's empty. There's nothing there. So two things happen. One, you become com I became completely unfulfilled. More importantly, I lost the ability to dream because my, my mind turned on me. My mind said, you don't even know what you want. That's what you wanted. Here you are and you feel worse. And that's where the that's where the booze really took off. It's funny you said that. So when I was graduating college, 
I wasn't living at my parents. I was me and my dad had a disagreement. My father, yeah, we'll put that mildly. Here's what that looks like. Yeah, I'll tell you what that looks like. Big top saying, take what you can grab and get out. And I said, well, I'll be back tomorrow for Irish my stuff. Irish luggage. Here's yeah, he said, I go, I go, I'll be back tomorrow for my stuff. He goes, this is my house. You're not coming back. And, uh, and I was big. I was a pretty muscly kid, but I was afraid of my dad. Always. So my father, um, I said, Dad, can I move home? He said, sure. Seven days a week. You're not allowed to drink while you live under my roof. You drive. Your mother's smoked while you can give me the BMW you bought because I just don't know if you bought it the right way. And... Um, you got a 10 p.m. curfew. Mm -hmm. And I did it because I respected my dad for a year. I lived there and I saved. I bought a house at 20 years old and I was all the outside stuff. And because the same thing, I wanted never to be poor again. My mom was a housekeeper. We were poor, but I didn't want to be like blue collar where my mom, my spouse would have to be scrubbing toilets. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, my mother was happy. I used to say, how are you so happy? And she'd say, because they're going to come home and the house can be so clean. They're going to be, they're going to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And she had such an appreciation for that. That's where I get my work ethic from. My mom was the hottest worker I've ever met. Um, even now she's raising, uh, my sister's helping my sister out a lot and my sister's son's three years old and my mother does a lot and she, she does it with a smile and she's okay with it. Um, I think what you nailed was though that for me, it was the same thing midway through my twenties. I'm having success by the end of my twenties. I've had a lot my mid twenties. I had a lot of success and it just wasn't. And even when I came back, when I got sober, when I first got sober, it was about spirituality. Then business to go over and I was having so much success with business. I used to have that mindset. You got to make it while it's there. And then one day it hit me. I'm like, it's coming in. God willing, if I have faith in anything greater than myself, it's going to always be there, mm -hmm. but I got to be happy. And I'm not happy. And you know, when I, when you first saw me come back around on the outside, people would have said a lot of things, but inside I hated everything. I hated myself. I, I mean, I loved my kids, but I wasn't capable of connecting on a deep level because I was in so much pain. You know, that pain when you're so, you're so selfishly absorbed in the pain and, and the, you've already, everything you've gotten, you know, God gave me everything I wanted to show me I didn't want it. And yeah, you know, I had the house, the car, I remember pulling in, I had the house paid off, the nice car, kids inside, mm -hmm. pretty wife, and you know, outside the driveway thinking, is this all there is? Mm -hmm. Is this all there is? God, this is, why I asked for this, I know, I, you gave me everything I asked for, but I need more. Yeah. And, uh, and that more for me, and I know for you, it comes with the spirituality and connecting with other people who struggle. Yeah, so there's, there's so much wrapped in that. It, the more I got on the outside, the worse I felt on the inside. The more I was recognized for my accomplishments on the outside, the more of a fraud I felt on the inside. So, you know, I'm a good 10 years older than you, so I've had... A, older than that. Yeah, way older than that. <laughs> I'm turning 35 again. It's an honest program. Uh, yeah, now I lost my train of thought. Alzheimer's is kicking in. No, the more you go on the outside, I agree. Keep going. It was, so I went out in Sarasota, Florida, and, and the kids are in. We put them in a really expensive school because, you know, you have to spend $12,000 to color. In, yeah. In, yeah, right? No, you don't. But I was okay with that, and here's why. I didn't care where they went to school. I mean, I didn't, I cared where that guy in that house, where did, where did his kids go to school? What is, what is that guy's kids go to school? I didn't, and it's so sickening to look back at how I lived my life. But it was all about what can I get? I'm going to put my kids in this school, not because there's a better education, because I want to meet that guy because he's a player in Sarasota, and I need to be in the crowd. I need to be in the crowd. And I, got, I was in the crowd. I had a press conference in Sarasota, Florida with the Stanley Cup, the real Stanley Cup, Dick Vitale, who had become a friend. Dickie V. Dickie v lives in Sarasota. He came and showed up to my press conference for me. We were building a, um, a hockey arena, um, East Coast League hockey team. And front page of the paper, I mean, you, you name it. The king. I was the king of Sarasota. And now I had arrived in two places. And then the whole world just collapsed. But even through all of that, it, the pain was so bad. And I, now I couldn't, ch I couldn't stop. I couldn't tell anybody. So... You know, fast forward, the, the magic, I think, the magic of recovery is this. Yeah. The magic of recovery are things that are antithetical to guys like you. And here's how I grew up. And my parents are great. Both sober. My brother and sister sober. Everybody's sober. Uncles and aunts, cousins, grandfathers. Oh, really? Yeah, but the, the immediate family, one black sheep. And I was dark black sheep. Right? Yeah. The blackest of sheep. But a couple of things happened with that. Even though they saw alcoholism out through their their family, you can't really be an alcoholic when you live in a $2 million house and you have another $2 million house and you have this yeah. car. So 
a lot that covered a lot of sins for a long time which i think makes it, the disease get worse for me i got my pick got lower because nobody could nobody could really step in and stop it because i'd say well look obviously i'm not doing that bad you know i how can i be an alcoholic did you see what i drove here and i that so my story is a little bit different right i didn't roll my very first AA meeting i will never forget it it was a monday morning i had disappeared yet again for a long weekend that i was supposed to just fly from Boston to Sarasota, and I ended up in Miami again because there was no connecting flight. <laughs> oh, and it's three days later, and everyone was pissed as well they should be, right? It was bad behavior. Um, and I said, you know, I think I'm an alcoholic. My ex wife's dad was in the program, and everybody went from pissed off to like, where did the floor parade? And I was like, well, that was easy. That's all I had to say. So I show up at this meeting 10 o'clock on a Monday morning, and, I, and I'm like, whoa. This is, yeah, this is weird. These are all, the average age was 100. 100, 130, right? <laughs> hey, young man, I've had 86 years of sobriety. I'm like, yeah, who are you? And get away from me. And I, you, do part of that. I don't know anybody that didn't drink for 86 minutes. So thank you. Good for you. So I didn't stay. I didn't come around. Um, but during the, those 10 years, so it took 10 years. This is a term we use a lot, right? The, the lights came on August 8th, 2008. We know what that looks like. I watched the lights come on with you. That's a gift. It's a gift like giving birth. Like I have five kids. You see that glow? Yeah. Watching the lights come on in recovery is kind of that same look. And someone on the outside has no idea what we're talking about. No, but anybody who's lived it is that, that I call it that. I saw it and I ran to a friend of mine at a meeting the other day. She used to babysit for us. This girl, great girl. And I said, to, I said to her after, I was like, I could see that spark in your eye that's God coming into your life. I said, I hope you don't get waked up. She goes, no, it's funny. I, I fought the God thing, but I kind of, and I'm like, I'm not talking about some desire in the sky. I'm talking there's that punch in somebody's eye when they get it. And there's just a connection with it, part of this positive energy. That's the magic of recovery, right? I, I can see, I know from you on a text message in the morning, how you're doing. It's true, it's true. I'll give you a call. You're not doing too good. I'm like, what do you mean? And you're like, I saw the text. It just didn't seem like, and it's accurate. But Well, because we build a baseline, right? So a lot of, and that, that I think is the magic of the program. The magic of the program going back to how we grew up. So my parents, great. This is what I remember about growing up and having conflict in the family. Anytime the voices were elevated, which was a lot, here's what I would hear. Close the windows. Yeah. So it didn't matter. I can't tell you when one of the arguments was about, and no one got hit. No one was no. being stabbed. It was just him yelling. But the biggest concern was that the neighbors didn't know. So that taught you at an early age to yeah. just bury, how you doing? Good. How you doing? Good. I don't care how you're doing, really. And I'm not going to tell you how I'm doing. So, yeah. th But I have, society suggests that I greet you I'm this I'm supposed way. to ask you this. I'm supposed <laughs> to ask yeah. you. <laughs> so, but it's funny, right? Yeah. But you learn that for guys like us, um, at some point, it's like hiding uh, Taco Bell under the couch in college. You know, after the first night, it might not smell the second night. But after Oof. a few years, you're going to have rats and cockroaches and it's going to start to smell. Well, that's feelings for me that we that we've stuffed down. Sometimes it can be stuffed for 10 years or 20 years or five years or two years. But at some point, that pop's going to top. The, the, the top's going to pop off and that smell is going to come out and that. And that's what happened. Now, to be able to say to you guys, right? Hey, how you doing? All right. You know what? Because we've shared some really yeah. intimate, dark things that, that were not appropriate for this conversation. But in that group of safety, not even the 17 guys, right? No, you got to distill that group down even further and say, hey, how you guys doing? And I don't even have to wait to say something, right? I don't have to wait for them to prod it out of me. I can proactively say, I need help. And by help, you know what that means a lot of times? Can you listen for 10 minutes? And there's something therapeutic about just listening. For me speaking it, it loses its power. That gives me the ability to do the day. That's the magic. So simple. And it doesn't cost anything. So again, going back to the app, what we tried to do, the meetings and the relationships of people that I've met in recovery sustain me today, period, end of discussion. And, and I met them in these rooms. Now, these rooms are hidden. They're yeah. hidden. And it's not just one. I'm not talking about just one 12-step fellowship that we happen to have an affinity for. I'm talking about oh, amazing, any program. Yeah. They're all hidden. But they're right outside the door. So I wanted to find a way to make it easier for somebody to find their first opportunity to connect 
with another person. You could figure, if we walk out this door, within five hours, there's 1,000 meetings, probably. There's, I think it's 1,189. And if you ask the average person. Imagine that, and you wouldn't even notice them. It wouldn't even notice them because, like you said, that you have a book and there's just something about the book. And then you have to go to different organizations. Every organization has it's a different book. book. So I wanted to put everything on one put place and put it on your phone because everybody's on their phone. Yeah. And then represent it graphically. So instead of looking at a list of things, the, let the map pop up and let you tell yourself, holy cow, I'm driving. I drive by this place every day. I'm going to sneak in there and I'm going to check it out. And I'm not telling anybody. Yeah. But I know inside uh, how I feel. So I'm, I'm going to check this out. And yeah, it's pretty cool. Right? And then I want to make it um, stickier. I want to take away the randomness of that first encounter. So we hear this a lot in the rooms. Well, I first came in in 2004 and I had a bad taste in my mouth and it took me 15 years to come back. Yeah. I want to create, and we have now a filter system, so you can kind of choose your own adventure. If you're not into the gone thing, you know, deselect that. Go to less spiritual meetings. If you're not into 12 steps, just select these other kind. But find your tribe. I have a daughter, two and a half years sober. Yeah. You know how many, you know how many meetings she's been to of the fellowship that I enjoy very much? Zero, right? Or one? Maybe five. Yeah, because I knew she didn't like it. It wasn't her. And then we were having this conversation earlier. So over the last two, if you asked me two and a half years ago, this is a girl that punched me in the face on Christmas Eve like 10 years ago. I mean, I like to hear you sometimes. <laughs> it's my daughter. And she looked, when she swung at me, I saw me. So she was me in a female. Uh, oh, so she was still drinking. This, oh. was, this was obviously what she yeah, was. I not, thought you met when she was young. No, there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of violence in my house when no. people aren't drinking. Well, no, but I, mean, I didn't know if it was when she was young. Or you no, was young. she's 24. We're, we're intervening, we're having some issues, and uh, I, I come over sober, and, and she comes at me like, I, I feel like I'm in Fanny Hall, you know, oh, back in the yeah, 80s, yeah. I'm just ready to throw, and it's my daughter, right, and it was just heartbreaking and sickening, and, and I tried to push her onto my path. Yeah, I remember you saying that. And I had guys say to me, and thank God for the program, stop, you're going to kill her, you're going to kill her, she's different than you. She's on her own path. Let her just, you lead by example, shut your mouth, tell a story with your feet, and watch what happens. Two and a half years later, she now has all the things that we think we get only from this program. She has. She has a sober podcast that she just started. Really? Yeah. She's got 15,000 followers on Surprisingly Sober on Instagram. And the girl she does it with, she's never met in real life. They met online two years ago, a two and a half. Yeah, right as soon as they were both getting sober. This girl's sober in California. Cassie's sober in Sarasota. I thought it was Cassie, but it was Yeah, yeah Cassie and, and Ariel. And Ariel's journey is much more similar to ours. She's about the same age, but she's rooms and meetings and dudes. I mean, girls, right? But yeah. All of the our stuff. And Cassie was owning it, being out in the open, changing friends, all the things we want. But you just didn't find it in that room. And it taught me a great lesson. And that was... There's so many roads. I don't care. I, all of our goal is to get to the top of this mountain. And there are 50 paths that we know about. And there might be 50 new ones. My only thing today, and it's all, I'm going to preach this till I die. I'll meet you at the top. I want you to choose your own path or one of the paths that I can show you. But go with somebody else. Because I've never met anybody that can do it by themselves. Yeah, I don't think you can. Well, Even if you could, it's a lonely. People need, I always say, like, think about it. If you, if all the great painters, they wouldn't want to have paint do artwork if there's nobody to see it. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't want a nice car if there's nobody. Let's face it, you wouldn't care what you drove if there was nobody else around. You wouldn't care what you wore. You know, all of the stuff that's ever been developed was developed because people want other people around them to even see. Even if it's not showing off you, it's just because they want to be around other people and look a certain, dress a certain way because that's their style. Everybody has something. We need people. We need community. Yeah. Um, part of this, that gratitude book I do, is you're supposed to pick, you know, three people you're grateful for and why you're grateful for them because relationships are so important. Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's a really shocking thing is that some people think they can do it alone or try to. They have no idea what they're doing to themselves. Uh, and I and, and I did it several ways, right? The beauty of this, so I never could have had that conversation with you um, going back to our, our, our interaction on Main Street. You know, here he is. He looks just, he's getting out, he's got the expensive suit, the same watch I used to have, a similar car, 
all this stuff. How you do it? Great, great, great. And I just know that that no that oh that I know what that great means. <laughs> <laughs> I want to die. I might drive into that pole yeah, on the way I, out of here. If I had a little more courage, I would have killed myself. <laughs> so that, that's all it came down to. If I had a little more courage at that point. Or life insurance. But thank God you didn't do either, yeah. right? Because I also was there, and that, and, and we hear that a lot in the rooms, and that's that's a tragedy. Um, and those don't go down as alcohol or drug deaths, but for me, they're every bit alcohol oh, and yeah. drug deaths. They go down as you know somebody who has suicide. It, and it's, just, it's, it's tragic. But I could not have communicated to you what I said. I didn't read that in a book. No, oh, you can't. You can't. Well, you can, but it wouldn't be as effective. It, it won't, yeah, you, you won't be able to read it off somebody else. Ryan, I know where you are because I was there. But more importantly, I know where you're going, and you don't think you're going there. But I'm telling you, you're going there because I was where you are. You know, if you're on this road, if I get on I-93 and I head north, I know where I'm going to end up. <laughs> no, <laughs> no matter what. Right? Yeah. You're going to New Hampshire. Yeah. Period. Doesn't matter what you think or what you want or what you try to do or anything. The question is, what ramp do you want? What exit are you going to get off at, dude? At some point, that road runs out. And I ran it to the end. You know, by the time I, the lights finally came on, there was nothing left. But what I gained, what I lost materially, which was everything, what I gained is simple things. A lot of people, hey, what's the best thing you gained in recovery? The ability to dream again. You don't hear that a lot. I lost yeah. the ability to dream. When you dream your whole life of going to the moon and you get to the moon and you're the only one there and it's dust and yeah. there's nothing there, you're like, all right, well, I'm done with this dream game because I don't even know how to do that right. Yeah. So I lost that, which which killed my ambition and killed my drive, which just fed my mental illness, which at the core is what we have Yeah. with that voice saying, you know what, you, you really, you're no good. At your core, you're no good. Who are you kidding? Who are you kid? Who are you trying to kid? Who are you trying to kid? Let's wrap it up. Let's quit. Right? You're never going to be anything. You're a piece of ba ba ba. Wow. All in my head. The relationships help quiet that. Today, one of my big gifts is no one on the outside. Multiple million dollar houses, multiple hundred thousand dollar cars. My gift last night, I got to put the lights on in my bathroom look in the mirror why don't I brush my teeth before I went to bed and not want to spit at the guy yeah that's a good feeling I mean you know when I first built my house I was sober but I was just miserable I didn't have one mirror in my house until me had to move in not in any bathrooms I thought I don't have much hair to brush my sideburns were always uneven even when I shaved I just didn't care because I hated what I would see and uh and I literally didn't own one mirror. I mean, I, I had a 4,000 square foot house without one mirror. And people used to say, well, and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> this is the beauty of, um, I would love to be able to, to, to shed a light on the community that we have inside these rooms. Because a normal person listening to that is like, this dude's crazy. <laughs> Crack the code. He can't eat. The, he's off. The, this is one flew over the cuckoo's nest. He should be locked up. Right? It's a rubber room guy. This Where are they filming this? Stanford State Hospital? <laughs> <laughs> Which would be appropriate also. But when you say that, this is what we get in the room. The magic of the rooms. No matter what story you're telling, there's some dude in the room nodding his head because he knows exactly how you feel. Yeah. I was 43 years old before I shaved in a sink. Yeah. I shaved in the shower because I couldn't look in the mirror. I oh, built yeah. my house, and I walked the electrician around, same giant house. I said, I want dimmer switches in all the bathrooms. I had mirrors, so I wasn't as psychotic as you. But I said, I want, well, di I want, <laughs> I want dimmer switches. He, you know, we typically don't do that in bathrooms. I go, put dimmer switches in the bathroom. Because I wanted to put the light down as low as possible. Because I didn't want to see myself. So here's a question for you. Now, obviously, you know, you lose everything. You start TVB, you get the... Everything gets shut down right after with COVID. I've I've had the privilege of watching you, um, which wasn't a privilege. It was hard to watch you go through a hard time. Mm. But I've also seen you start climbing back. And like I see your business, both your businesses get better. You know, you move dirt. I don't understand anything about moving dirt. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm not a guy getting hang a picture on a wall. You know what I mean? You know, I, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that goes against the deal. I'm not driving the equipment, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even know how to move dirt, though. But, you know, you, you move moving dirt, you're helping them build up some of the gas stations around, like the waterfront, because obviously the water levels and global warming that apparently people think isn't happening, but water levels seem rising. I'm all about so, it now. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Bring yeah. it up. Bring it up, exactly. <laughs> global warming, terrible. It's all just, about it. But I actually do believe in global warming. But that That's another means, episode. Yeah, that's another episode. But that being said, um, 
you know, you're coming back. What do you think the biggest thing you did between last winter and now is? Partly, that's a true statement, right? I, I built a tribe, so I came up here full time, basically back in November, ended a relationship, a re recovery relationship, picked up a 10 year medallion, um, and, and, I, and I hit an emotional bottom in recovery. And what that looked like for me was, I, I had done well, recovery had worked for me, the, the obsession to drink is long gone, I help other people, I have a healthy family, I've made my amends, I'm, I'm outwardly successful. But then the demons started to creep back in of, is this all there is? Remember you used to have this and now you have that. And, look what, and then I started to do this, which I hated. I started to get jealous. Look at what he's doing. Look at what he's doing. Look at what, he, and then and I started to get angry, and that. So th to answer your question, very I think simply is this: every problem I've ever had, once I was able to get physically sober, manifests in my brain. So I had to find a way to manage my thought process, and I do that several different ways. I regularly attend meetings. I have a deep connection of guys both in Sarasota and Boston that are in recovery that know my baseline. So when they look at me or they see a text message, and it's not just the little groups of 17, it's literally everywhere. It's my family now. It's everywhere. So I'm honest. How are you doing? Not good. I'm not doing good today. I'm not doing good today. Okay, what does that look like? Well, I don't know. Okay, well, let's talk about it. So I, I do a lot of journaling. Um, meditation has become a, a big, big thing. I've, I've cut news out. So what I realized yeah. was I was this news junkie. So 24 hours a day, I would have the news channel playing in the background of just, there's, there's never a good, you know, no one's saving puppies on the news anymore, right? Every story is just tragic. Yeah, Trump this, and Biden chaos that, yeah, yeah. And half of, and it made up, right? But it's just this incessant noise of crap. So that's what was going in. And that was feeding a, uh, my mind is a river of basically thoughts. And it's an algorithm. It was explained to me that your brain's an algorithm. So when you pause, on something negative, your brain says, he wants more of that. It doesn't know why you pause. It didn't know you pause because you hate that. It just knows that you spent yeah. more time on it so it feeds you more. So it, it was this cycle of spiral of death. And, and I was able to stop that. I was able to institute some mindfulness. Most importantly, I was able to get the journal, see what was going on, realize most of my concerns weren't real. They were thoughts. Mother's of I, I was feeling guilty about it, something. <laughs> <laughs> or I was projecting doom and gloom next week. But it was never, none of it really happened. And all right, there in the spot. And there's ma the magic of the journal, and this worked for me years ago. I was able to bring this back. I can look at my own words. You can tell me everything's going to be okay. And I can nod you and shake your hand and give you a hug. But when I read my own words in a book, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And then two weeks later, go back, and I don't even remember who was this person and what was that issue? And I was getting, what? There's two things you shared with me that have really had an impact over the last year, especially. Like years, over the years, it's been good. But one thing was the journal links. I was going through some stuff with work and I started having old fears pop up. And I wrote them down. I started going back and I'm like, I thought that was happening. But I had the week after, I had my best week ever. And, or whatever it was, there were different things that I would see in my own writing that I was waiting for the ball to drop and the ball just didn't drop. The second thing was this, and this is probably the most important thing for me. Move a muscle, change a thought. Every day when I get lost in my head, which happens once a day, I work, I go work out. I don't care what it takes. I blast through a workout and then suddenly I'm a different guy. Yeah. And that was that was given to me early recovery, right? They teach you stuff and you look at them like, I'm going to stab you in the throat. I'm in so much pain and you're telling me to stop getting the newspaper delivered to my house? To walk to the gas station to get the newspaper? I, I'm going to kill you. Save my life. And here's how it looked. I was really struggling. And he said, tell me your morning routine. What time are you struggling? As soon as I wake up. Okay, what's your morning routine? Well, I wake up, I have coffee, I read the newspaper. Stop the newspaper. Why? Stop the newspaper, walk to the store and get the newspaper. Change my world. Move a muscle, change the thought is what he told me. And it didn't have to be a recovery muscle. You can go to the gym. Yeah. There was just something about putting on a hat, brushing my teeth, walking outside. I heard a bird. I saw a person. I made a contact. Somebody smiled. The world was functioning. But if I stayed in that room with the shades drawn, reading crap from the newspaper, no wonder I felt like shit. It, I'm yeah. sorry. It, no, no, I curse all the time. <laughs> you know what? I could curse one time. I didn't know that. That was a rule. We could start over. <laughs> so that <clears throat> move a muscle, change a thought. And there was a lot of dark days this winter, which I've shared with the group, where 
some days the best I could do, best I could do as a functioning adult was get up, go to that 10 o'clock meeting and run right back home and crawl in bed and just hope that the next day was gonna be better. And, and, and that has worked. That's, I don't suggest that as a long-term solution to anything, but I was able to make those phone calls and guys would call me and, and bringing in the mindfulness. So the old day was just like you, I had, it was the gym. I would get, now I get on the bike. Now I get into these mindfulness podcasts and these, I put healthy things into my brain. I do meditation. So the old days of, you know, I would put on Eminem, a hooded sweatshirt, limp biscuit, headphones, and hit the heavy bag until I physically couldn't move. And, and that took the pain away. Now it's just the opposite. This morning, two 15-minute meditations where I just sit there and I, and I watch my breath. And I do that box breathing. Or I do a guided, like this morning was one guided meditation. It was one breathing meditation. And here's what I can promise you. When you count your breaths, or when you say in and out over a period of minutes and a period of days, it is impossible for that guy to keep telling you you're a piece of crap. It just, you can't tell your brain, stop feeding me that bad information. You have to physically suspend it. You have to arrest that yeah. thought. And, and mindfulness and meditation in that has taught me how to do that. And that's just been magic. For a guy who can't sit still. Yeah, the, the magic is in the pause. It really is. Uh, but I think for a lot of us, I have to pause or replace with something, work out with this and that. Now, I do try to implement me meditation every day now. For a while, I used to do it every day, nonstop, like different times. Then I went five, six years without it. And I, you know, all the things that gave me success, I got away from. Mm. And now I'm back to meditate. It's I'm not going to say I do 15 minutes. I'm not going to like eight to 10. But if I'm doing even a five-minute meditation, just something to stop, to get caught up in my breathing, or my thoughts not go. Because if you're thinking about in, hold, one, two, out, You one, can't think two, of anything you else. You can't. But it's funny how if, if – <laughs> I say this a lot. If I was seven foot four, I'd be in the NBA, but I'm not. If I took all the suggestions that were given to me early on, you know, I, I'd have 23 years of sobriety. I'd be probably north of $100 million in, in wealth. Maybe I'd be the president. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'd be different, but I think I'd be happy too, right? I'm a stubborn, stubborn guy. Meditation was introduced to me in that first year of recovery where, when I still had the fancy cars and the fancy houses and I thought all of these people were nuts and I was only going to keep the house good. I was yeah. going to, you know, put the fire out at home. Get the pressure off. I'm just here for a little while, guys. You know, don't, <laughs> don't get too close to me. I'm like, I ain't hanging around. But thank God you have a place to go. <laughs> Guy introduced me, he said, there's a, there's a place in Western Massachusetts where they have uh, retreats, Vipassana retreats, 10-day meditation. 10-day what? I couldn't meditate for 10 milliseconds. Well, explain this to me. Yeah, it's a 10-day silent retreat, and it's free. And here's why it's 10 days. Most people don't meditate, don't continue to meditate. And this is normal people, not just recovery people, because they never do it long enough to feel the benefit. And there's some magic about 10 days. And he said, it's going to be terrible. It might be the worst experience you you will ever have in your life for six. Good advertising. No, it is. Because <laughs> nobody, he sold me six or seven or eight days. But then it will switch. And then you will have a euphoria and a benefit, which will always bring you back to this. And that's why we do 10 days. Now, I didn't take that advice back then. But I knew because my recovery. You want to know something funny? My buddy, Kevin, the vet, who's a client of us and one of us, he uh, does... 10 day retreats, all time silent meditation, silent retreats. So, and it's funny. But how, he's kind of crazy. Well, a different version of crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's funny how the, how the same things kind of recycle themselves. That's been my experience in, in life, right? Things that I'm supposed to be doing keep manifesting, they keep showing up. So, at some point, um, Bruce Almighty, I wish God would only send me a sign, and he's running over signs. Stop, don't go, yeah, bridge yeah. out. Where I wish there was a sign, boom, drives off the bridge. I know what that feels that like. That was me. <laughs> this can't be a real sign. <laughs> so now, fast forward to 2023. Well, 2022, I sign up for the 10 day Vipassana retreat in Western Massachusetts. Uh, it comes within 13 days of me having to go, and, and I pull the COVID card. I don't, I don't have COVID, but I am scared to death. To go so I don't go I've now signed up for it again I was approved to go back and I 
I still have 15 days to cancel if I decide to, but it's scheduled for October. And uh, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna do it, and here's why. It keeps manifesting in my life. So the first time was a sponsor that was from Massachusetts 22 years ago. And every few years it would pop up in, in this latest app that I'm doing, this dude has been on two full years, not together, not continuous, uh, of silent meditation. And, and he claims that the Vipassana at this particular location out in Western Massachusetts is one of the things that really changed his life. And he's not an addict or an alky. He's just a guy who touts the benefits of stilling your mind. Yeah. My, If I can control this thought process, my brain is like a really dysfunctional Instagram feed. It's just in, in my in my sickness <laughs> wants to grab on the the more toxic. Let's linger on that. Yeah. And then I wonder why I feel like crap. It's like eating McDonald's all day long. Wonder why now I'm sitting on the toilet. Right. Well, yeah. you, you, what you put in, what you get out. So now I put different stuff in. I put healthy relationships in. When I bike ride now, I've replaced the gym with bike riding. You know, I'm doing yeah. 80, 100 miles a week. I don't. I'm not listening to. Drake and 21 Savage, which I used to, right? I'm banging yeah. through the woods like I'm at a rave party. Now I'm listening to audiobooks and mindfulness yeah. discussions. That's and, the good stuff. Now, if you told me that 15 years ago, I would have told you, please take me out of my misery because that sounds dreadful. See, I find that stuff that, that when I'm on my game, I'm listening to audiobooks, healthy, you know, YouTubes. When I'm not, I'm just banging out Eminem or, I'm, you know, Blasting around the car, YouTube play. And it's just something, that, but that that doesn't address anything. It po it gets you away from it for a little while, but often it feeds into those negative. When you talk about things coming around, I really believe we have a feed, and God and the universe put things in front of us. And the more we're supposed to do it, the more it starts shooting in front of us. The ten day retreat. Ten, one of our friends, my friend George, it was on a couple weeks ago. George is the one that worked with Kobe Bryant and Michael yeah, Jordan. Yeah, yeah. George, uh, George lived in a meditation retreat center for three years. Mm -hmm. He's a whole different kind of crazy. Yeah, but he was he's so good at meditating he's actually going to come do a thing for a bunch of the guys from AA he's going to do it or the program sorry uh, he's going to do a, a, a thing here secret for, handshake uh, yeah <laughs> he's going to come do a thing for us because um, yeah. a bunch of guys ask me like can you introduce me but I'm like I can't give you his number but he'll come in and do a mindfulness re thing here yeah and, and, you know the, the mindfulness and you know and I, I kind of I feel like I want to kick my own ass when I use these words like mindfulness and meditation and all that but you know the truth is this it's okay. It, it has helped me. And I and I discounted it and I laughed at it. Basically, everything that's ever helped me in recovery are things that I looked down upon or laughed at or mimicked or ridiculed. And it was out of fear. The pain. It was, well, it was out of fear. I, I was too fearful of trying something new because what if it didn't work? And the pain, when you do, though, when you're in enough pain, you have nothing else. And you don't have the, t not when the pain gets bad enough. Yeah, I'll you'll, try anything. You, you'll make a change. And and this is, that's been a game changer. I mean, one of my greatest, on Monday nights, so here's my routine, right? I picked up the Zoom commitment at the group that we go to. So now I take the bike in the car. I'm in the woods for two hours before the meeting, listening to just really healthy, whatever it is, just peaceful stuff, conversations, books, whatever it is. And it's starting to be dusk. It's usually from 5 to 7.15. And then all of a sudden, the, the deer are coming out. And the animals are coming up but on the bike paths in the woods up in Winchester. And they don't run away. And I'll stop. And I'll look. And they'll look. And, and it, it sounds so weird. Oh, no, that's a nice feeling. Oh, my God. Because you're one with nature then. Do you know what I mean? I know it sounds great, but you're part of it. Yeah. Because I think that, you know, I'm a, I am can feel your energy, right? We vibrate. I'm a, I'm a big energy guy. And I believe, you know, the animals, even your dog, your cat. Oh, God, yeah. So that's how they function, right? And and there's some healthy, and it, there's a calmness yeah. that I now bring that I don't think I ever even could have fathomed, you know, a decade ago, right? So yeah. phase two of recovery, I'm looking forward to it. It's everything for me is about controlling my mind and deepening my relationships, period. Now, one more thing, get back to TBV before we wrap up. Um, how do people look into it? Because I know that people ask me all the time, like, well, how do I find out more about it? Because it's, it's everybody's concerned about, one, people that have family members are addicts, addicts or alcoholics. People are addicts or alcoholics. My clients care because if I'm, in, if I'm involved in your money, you want people like me sober. How do people that are touched somewhere or another look into it? Yes, great question. So um, we're in a big re-pivot right now. So we're, we're, we're 
changing all the technology. We're adding new groups. So we're adding Al-Anon. We're adding um, three or four other nationally recognized groups. So we will be launching, uh, relaunching with a QR code probably in the next two or three weeks. You can go to TBVME, tbvme.com. You can see the website, see the story. You can go on either one of the app stores and fill out the, the form and I will send you, a, the, it goes to the call center and they will send you an invitation. That's how you have to get it right now. But in the next three or four weeks, it'll be distributed everywhere. So we have pilot programs rolling out both in Massachusetts and in Florida where it'll be distributed by QR code to first responders because the first responders, the cops, the firemen, the ambulance, the emergency room, they are having tens of thousands of calls a day uh, across the country and 80% of them are mental health and alcohol and drug yeah. related. So the cops are now trying to leave that interaction with some community resources. So now you can Makes scan sense. the QR code. Now I know that you're not gonna throw the pamphlet in the yeah. trash. I know you're not gonna throw your phone away. So you get it on your phone and then maybe like we know, that dark night of the soul will come. You know, I'm just yeah. I'm just downloading it because what the cops in the yeah, drive. I get it off my back, but at one a.m. But three in the morning, I might go. You know, no one's looking because I know. I'm not telling you I know, but I know. So wow, then you realize it's right there. And to be able to demonstrate a few things: one, it's hidden in plain sight. This infrastructure, this is not unique, right? It's estimated coming out of COVID. <coughs> this is <coughs> sickening. So the number in recovery that you hear a lot when you're in the industry is 23.5 million people are in recovery. Coming out of COVID, right? I'm not just interested in that. That's us. That's probation. That's jail. Yeah. That's in the rooms. Coming out of COVID, the number is 100 million. And here it is. People who have either been in recovery, are in recovery, or who have abused or misused alcohol, prescription drugs, or illicit drugs in the last 30 days. That's one third of the country. We have a depression epidemic Right. General Surgeon, Surgeon General made an announcement on that. CDC came out with suicidal ideation rates which through the roof. So we've got this lack of connectivity, mental health crisis, and people abusing coming out of COVID. So we just want to make this like, hey, you want to check it out? Just come check it out. You yeah, don't have to get these resources. Come check them out. Right. And here it is. Come check us out. Pick your path. Make it easy. It's hidden in plain sight. And I promise you this. It works, dude. Yeah, it does work. And you're going to see somebody you know in these rooms, right? Because yeah, they are always walking to see. I've never walked into me, not, know, not even just from the program. Like, I walked in early on, and I'd be like, oh, so, and it's just it's that warm feeling like I belong here. Yeah. But in early recovery, like, who am I going to see yeah, in there? Yeah, like, you, yeah, you, just, <laughs> just so you know, they're in there, they got the same issue as you. And guess what? They're not going to be surprised to see you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was no mystery. You know, somebody said to me, are you worried? But like, when people know that you had addiction, everybody knew I had an addiction problem. They just have him doing something about it. So on my Facebook page, uh, Chuck Madden, my line under my face is, I am not anonymous. Now, that's not for everybody. Yeah. But I am all about trying to break the stigma, get yeah, rid of I the shame. shame about it. You know, we have a thing. Everyone knew I was a drunk. Yeah. So now I want everyone to know I'm, I'm not a drunk. Yeah. And there's a way out. And I'm a different guy. So if you need help, give me a call. Yeah. I, give me a call. I, I love that. You know, that, Chuck, you've been a huge role player in my life, I'll tell you. And I'm grateful to have you, brother. Well, you know, it's, it, it, it goes both ways, right? You were one of those guys that I could that, that I could talk to. I could see a younger version of me. I've watched the lights come on in you. Um, and we do this together. You know, yeah. that's the thing. That's the beauty of this, right? There's no leaders. There's no... Yeah, some days you lead, some days you follow. Yeah. And some days you're laying on the ground and somebody comes and picks you up. Thanks, Love, brother. Love you, man. Love you, bro.